Thank you very much, Nafisa Mohammed. Um, if I may say that um, Nafisa was invited here because um, we've known her for a very long time in the women's movement in multiple capacities. Um, and that, Nafisa, you were invited here not just in your capacity as a Muslim woman, but because of your familiarity with the, um, from your experience in the Attorney General's office, as well as with um, activities around the decade uh, for women in the 1970s and uh, with your own struggles on behalf of women within as well as outside of the community. And I think women's multiple locations need to always be remembered. I also want to say that w um, I hear you very much on your discomfort um, you know, and your apologies. And, and I think the way you spoke from the heart is very important for us to remember because women may often be put in the position of feeling that they're failing on one end or another to live up to some expectation, but that um, the Institute for Gender and Development Studies as part of the women's movement, our goal is to promote dialogue um, that is not um, about blaming or about ostracizing or about um, advancing our divisions, but about creating a basis for us to come to some common understanding in a way that benefits girls and women in our society. Um, and finally, I think your, I, your suggestion that consensus, that the strategies around consensus building need to be uh, put foremost, need to be taken very seriously. I just wanted to say that we, um, we did certainly want to include Muslim women's voices, uh, Hindu women's voices. We also needed to uh, bring Orisha women's uh, Orisha voices here, particularly women's, um, as part of supporting the idea that this is a discussion that needs to happen with many different voices uh, in dialogue. So uh, let me just um, now welcome Dr. Jackie Sharp. She'll be bringing the perspective from the Family Planning Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Sharp. Thank you very much, Gabby, and greetings, everyone, members of the panel and the audience. Um, I want to tell you a story about six months ago. I met a young lady whom I will call K.S. at the place that I work. I'm a child psychiatrist. I run the clinic at Mount Hope. She was referred for evaluation following a suicide attempt. The reason she had taken the overdose, and I'll tell you a very brief story. She was 14 and she ran away from home to be with the man that she'd fallen in love with, a Muslim boy of 19. She's a Muslim girl as well. They were away for a couple of days and then her father found her, brought her back home, went to the family of the young man and said, you must marry my daughter. But there's other things that these people have besides religion in common. One of them is a working class girl. The Muslim boy is very wealthy. His father very quickly didn't want his 19 year old getting married. And so dad contracted another marriage for her with an older man. She took an overdose. She reached her age of 15. She's living as a bride. And she said to me, I can't deal with this married thing now. I want to go back to school. So that's where I want to start my presentation. Because I want to say that child marriage is early marriage, defined as any marriage carried out before the age of 18, before a girl is physically or emotionally ready to take on the responsibilities of marriage and childbearing. It involves either one or both spouses being children, and it may take place with or without formal registration under civil, religious, or customary laws. Now, though that marriage of KS is, they don't get registered in the Red House, but it took place under religious and customary law. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Convention for the Elimination of discrimination against women all have clauses that speak specifically to the fact that the age of consent for marriage should be 18. CEDAW in its recommendation in 2021 20, explicitly deals with equality in marriage and family relationships, outlaws child marriage, and stipulates that 18 years should be the minimum age of marriage for both males and females. 
the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that marriage should be entered in only with the free and full consent of intended spouses. And the Convention of the Rights of the Child defines a child as every human being below the age of 18 years. So we have clear statements that 18 really is below 18 is not a, an age for contracting marriage. Child marriage is associated with many health risks. Young brides, and health risks particularly for the girls, young brides often have limited access to and use of contraceptive and reproductive health services and information. The majority of them, because they marry young, are now exposed to frequent and early sexual relationships relations and repeated pregnancies and childbirth before they're physically mature and psychologically ready. Now we know that teenagers who are not married also might have sexual intercourse, but adolescent sex outside of marriage is often not frequent. Marital sex is frequent sex. The other thing that happens in marital sex is that the ability to negotiate condom use with, with a big age differential with a young woman married to an adult male becomes very difficult. And we know from the UN AIDS statistics for the Caribbean that young women between the ages of 15 and 24 are nearly six times as likely to be HIV positive to be affected than young men are. And this really speaks to the fact that young women are engaging in unprotected sex and either are unable or, or don't have access to the relevant information that they need to, and the power, they need to protect themselves. These data call into question the often deeply engraved belief that marriage protects young women from HIV. Many adolescents, particularly the youngest brides, marriage greatly increases the potential for exposure to the vi virus because, as I said, marriage results in a transition from vir virginity mm -hmm. to frequent unprotected sex. Marriage also, child marriage also impedes for us the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. As you know, the Millennium Development Goals were promulgated by the United Nations in 2000, and Trinidad and Tobago is a part of that process. And there are eight goals, and I think six of them are relevant to what happens to, to child marriage and, and the impact that child marriage may have on our achievement of the goals. First of all, the first goal is to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Early marriage usually means that the young person's economic and decision-making powers are impaired and therefore their ability to provide for themselves and also to nourish their offspring is impacted. Goal two, achieve universal primary education. Quite often, universal education as a right for many girls is Im impeded by the issue of child marriage. And even if we take that out of it, the limited education that young women who marry have impacts on what happens to the education of their own children. Goal three, promote gender equality and empower women. Eliminating gender equalities and empowering young women requires access to the basic capabilities in education, health, and nutrition, but also critical social and economic resources and opportunities within an enabling environment. Child marriage disadvantages women and girls and entrenches gender inequalities reduce child mortality. We all know that children born to women under the age of 14 have more likelihood of being premature, to be of low birth weight, and child brides, since they are more vulnerable to HIV, a greater risk of, of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Child marriage also means that the young woman's infant is more likely to be at risk. Goal five is to improve maternal health. And young mothers have double the chance of dying during childbirth and to suffer from ill health as a result of pregnancy. And finally, come back to HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and I've already spoken to that issue. But more fundamentally, Trinidad and Tobago, as all the state parties that ratify international conventions accept by so doing the legal duty to abide by the conventions and therefore become obliged to take steps to protect and exercise the enjoyment of the human rights to investigate violations and to provide effective remedies to the victims. One benefit of citizenship should definitely be that 
protection of one's rights, either by national constitution or the body of laws of the country should happen. Therefore, all girls of women can expect that their governments would protect their rights and that the human rights of the most vulnerable would be protected, respected, and fulfilled. And in this context, young women are among the vulnerable. Key international regional human rights laws on women and children have addressed variously the problem of child marriage. And I want to bring the example of the government of the Republic of India. This is a country has a huge population that has a major issue addressing the issue of child marriage. It is an entrenched customary law. They have the biggest Hindu population in the world and they have one of the largest Muslim populations in the world. Yet, the government of India in the, in, on the 10th of January 2007 proclaimed the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act in which the age for marriage is set at 18 for girls and 21 for boys. Now you could argue that the age should be the same, but the point is they have taken the step to honor their commitments under law. And there's a whole long act, it's on the website, you can look at it and see all the, all the things. And clearly it's, the law does not make it perfect, but the law signals that the state a, recognizes its responsibility. B, it puts mechanisms in place, not just allow the law to be prosecuted, but also mechanisms in place to make the, the application of the law happen. I think in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a responsibility under our signatory to all these conventions, particularly on the Convention of the Rights of the Child, to take action to change the marriage age. It does not mean that we do not respect people's religious and other things, and I understand totally Nafisa's dilemma in a certain sense, but I also heard very clearly that Nafisa was also saying that we need to look at the laws and change them. So I want to end by saying just this. Where, and I'm quoting Eleanor Roosevelt, when she spoke in 1958 on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any of the maps of the world. Yet they're the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or not co college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, and equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerned citizens' actions to uphold them close to whom, we should look in vain for progress in the larger world. Thank you.